Yo, 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 welcome to another talk show with me, Zikri Khalil, the host for It Matters, where whatever we talk about really matters to every single one of you who is watching this right now, whether you're in Malaysia, whether you're in Sabah, whether you're in Borneo, whether you're in uh, any parts of the world. Um, today, we are in conjunction with the World Refugee Day. Uh, we believe that it's important that we have someone here who could literally incite you all the things that really matter with what's going on with the whole refugee crisis. And there's no one other than anyone else I couldn't take off to um, help us share in this particular topic. Uh, we have here um, Deborah Henry, um, who is the co one of the co-founders of Fuji.org. Welcome Deborah to the show. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Likewise, it's always a pleasure. I think this is like our seventh time having you with us in the span of 10 years of our relationship working together. Um, but thank you so much for doing this again. Could not have thought of anyone else uh, that could be uh, great for this. Um, I'm just going to go straight at it, Deborah. You know, this is not a hard talk session, but more of trying to understand and that we're living in a pandemic world, going to our second year now, and having you and your team on the ground, uh, where all of us are pretty much busy with on how to keep us afloat. What is it like with our refugee community in Malaysia alone? Um, well, just to be honest, I mean, it's a compounding effect. Uh, refugees in Malaysia already have it hard. Um, they can't work legally. Their kids don't have access to school. So life here is very much, um, it's uncertain, it's precarious, um, and uh, you're living on very little. That's just, let's just say you're living kind of month to month in a way, right? So if one part of that puzzle falls apart, you're in deep trouble. And so the pandemic pretty much did that for many refugee individuals, families and communities at large. Uh, many people lost jobs, uh, were unable to pay rent, unable to pay their uh, health care bills. Um, many families were not even able to put food on the table. So as an organization, even though our role is primarily focused on education programs, uh, we had to kick into gear. We had to pretty much provide emergency relief aid to a lot of the families. Um, and that was pretty much food, rental assistance, healthcare, and um, and to help them go through this go through this tough time. And you know, at the end of the day, what matters really most when you what matters most beyond education, beyond the frills, if you want to call it that, is is survival, right? And so the role Fuji played was pretty much keeping families fed, keeping people safe. And how is it different this time? Like we know the the, the work that you guys have been doing, and um... Same with the other similar NGOs who've been yeah. doing an amazing job to attend to our refugee communities. But how is it different this time in the sense of operation-wise? Uh, are there were there repercussions with law and order much more stringent compared to how it was before pandemic? What is it like um, this time around? I mean. Well, firstly, a lot of everyone's meant to be staying at home, right? So your uh, assumption is that everyone just has, wears your mask, go out only when you need to and stay at home otherwise. And um, that's pretty much been what the year has been like. Uh, but in terms of vaccination, uh, the ha um, refugee community having access to vaccinations, there's a lot of confusion around that. And obviously the relevant parties are trying to make sure that it happens, but that's taking time. Um, you know, they've also been some of the leadership, some of the sentiments coming out of our leadership has not been very positive. It's kind of fueling more xenophobia. So a lot of uh, refugees and, and are scared to leave their homes. And, you know, you're scared that you're going to get stopped by the cops or immigration. You're going to get pulled up. You're going to get put into detention center. So th there is a lot of fear as well, uncertainty. Um, if you read the papers, you see um, you talk about people who are illegal being picked up and Yes. Yeah, so I think if you're an individual who's already, yes, you may have a UNHCR card, but if you're already living in a, in a if you're already feeling very un, insecure and unsure about where you stand when it comes to the law, this just makes things even worse for you. Um, on top of that, like I said earlier, it's a compounding effect. On top of that, you have so many personal issues, mental health issues. You got to think about your family, your kids. Um, let's just say it's not a good place for someone to be mentally or uh, from any perspective. Wow, um, what a lot of, um, I mean, we, we, can, we can definitely establish that, that these, these are the, the main um, things that's going on right now. Um, but I wanna talk more about the children of the refugee communities, you know, mentally, yeah. you know, and 
I mean, a lot of your work is is helping to um, help gradually progress them so that they're they're made ready, you know, upskilling them. But um, how are they going through? You know, seeing that you know they have to endure already with their uh, parents um, on trying to survive. But um, from from a from the perspective of the children itself, like what changes have you seen? Uh, has it gotten worse or um, um, what could you say on that? Well, I, I do think children are far more resilient than we give them credit for. Um, they can actually, they shouldn't have to go through a lot, but they do. And, 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 but the reality is that they, they can actually be far more resilient. Um, and in, uh, in, from my experience in my travels to various refugee communities around the world, and also through my experience in Malaysia, it is extremely important for children to maintain a sense of routine and normalcy. So the role of a school um, is actually really, really important. Um, regardless of this, whether we were in a CMCO, MCO lockdown and what have you, I think for us, it's been trying to make sure that they wake up every morning, they have access to school, they have to log in, they have classes, they have homework. There's something for them to focus on. Um, this is not to say that the kids, and the, especially the older kids, are not going through difficult times. There are mental health issues. Uh, there are kids who are dealing with anxiety, degrees of depression, and the stress is getting to them. We've had students who've had to drop out of school to work, to support their families. So the effects are very real um, and, and they are felt. Um, what we do as an organization is, like I said, provide a sense of routine and normalcy for the kids so that that also helps the parents and the families, but also um, services, um, sort of after school services for mental health. Um, if families have food issues, obviously not having food on the table or food in a child's belly is going to affect their performance in school. So making sure that they have food to eat. So um, pretty much right now, when we're looking at the 360, 360 degree approach of the child um, and what they need to be able to feel a little bit safer um, in this current situation. Having said that, um, there's bunch of viewers already watching this and I'm trying to see how we can help understand our viewers at the moment today or in the future like why should they really care about this knowing that it's not directly impacting them it's not something that they deal with every single yeah. day but I'm sure there's a connection of why does it really matter you know how is this um, how how can ordinary people like like our viewers here really take more initiative to understand how this does impact them in many, many ways and yeah. why do they care? Well, let me just say, I guess, two points. One is um, coming out of the pandemic, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's, it's showed me that um, we are all very connected, more connected than we think. Even if you think something is two, two degrees, five degrees away from you, the pandemic has showed us that one man's problem can very much become somebody else's problem. So the issue of being of refugees and the fact that people are refugees um, and they may be in our country, it may not directly affect your life uh, on a day to day basis, but times are changing and we're seeing more refugees are actually refugees as a result of climate change. And so we don't know where the next refugee population is going to come from. It could be you. So I guess put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, if, if one fine day you're knocking on someone's door asking for help, you want to hope that they're going to let you in. Um, that's number one. Number two is it's really a humanitarian issue. Um, I think if we can take the refugee label and put it aside for a bit and actually just go, these are human beings, just like you and me, who are fleeing their lives, fleeing their home country, everything they love. They don't want to come here. They're happy to stay home. But when you've got bombs dropping on your house, you have guns pointing at you, when you've lost loved ones, when it is literally unsafe for you or your family to stay that is when you leave um and then there's a quote by this uh, poet and she talks about when when um putting your kid in in the water when being in the water is safer than being on the land and i think that gives us some perspective um of danger of a threat and i ask you guys what would you do to save a loved one how what would you do to protect someone that you care about pretty much anything whether you consider it legal or not legal and so um, that is really what we're asking. We're, uh, it's more a humanitarian plea, a fellow human being who needs some help, not charity forever, but basically a hand, not a handout, but a hand up. And I think that's what it's about, a hand up so that they can be able to live a more fulfilling and better life. I mean, that's very well said. I, I hope the viewers understand, you know, from my perspective here, you know, 
the other day, my our content team had to come up with the top ten refugee crisis at the mm -hmm. moment. And yeah, thinking, of, yeah, thinking of that fact that we have to create a content basing on a top ten of refugee crisis in the world is just out of my you know is is mind blowing. Just so that yeah. people understand, and and not many people knew, know this, but. Uh, this is the worst refugee crisis since uh, World War II. Um, and the number has doubled def uh, every single year. And um, I, I think what there should be done more is to look at more entities who know what they're doing and look at how they can support whatever they can and try to understand the connection that you just made on um, everyone is affected in, in, any, uh, in any possible means, especially during a pandemic. And having said that, how can people who are watching this um, support you? You know, what is the call to action here? Because we don't just want the awareness going, but we want people to start taking it. And we definitely help them out, you know, trying to funnel them uh, directly to as many entities as possible, like uh, Fuji uh, at the moment. So what will be your call to action, how they can come on board and help you and, and do something more that really matters? Well, I think number one is definitely have a conversation about it. Dialogue, to me, dialogue is always the start of change. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to people, because if people are not informed, um, if they don't see it from a different perspective, then they're not going to be mobilized to do anything. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it would be, um, yes, absolutely get involved and get involved with people, communities who are marginalized, communities who, who fall through um, the gaps. They don't have a safety net there to catch them, to protect them. Um, for us, definitely um, financial donations are a big thing right now because um, funding is very hard at the moment. So if you can give, go to our, um, go to our a, um, website, there's a donate button, you can donate. That money goes 100% towards educating the 200 refugee children at our school. We believe that, uh, like we said, move away from charity to self-reliance, self-sufficiency. So the biggest gift you can give someone is the gift of an education because that changes lives, that changes outcomes. And you never just help one person, the change is generational. How many of you out there uh, know how all your parents had the privilege of a, a degree, a scholarship that then changed your life and has changed your family life, family's lives. We all know people. Um, secondly, we've just launched our Fuji High Ed Scholarship and that is with incitement. We're running a fundraiser on their page. So I'm sure Zikri, you can share that link and whatnot, but um, individuals, you know, give the gift of a scholarship to someone. Um, if you are running a company, your company can co-sponsor co the scholarship with us um, or even sponsor a year of, of a refugee um, youth's education degree. Um, and, and these are all very, I mean, I like this. I, I, I like this because it's tangible. It's very life-changing. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela always um, used to say, uh, an education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And I think that's a very powerful statement. And I would encourage all of you guys to invest in change and invest in the education of a person. Uh, thank you so much Barbara, for, for sharing that call to action. And definitely there's a lot of things that we can do. It's just a matter of just, um, you know, uh, touching the right buttons for those who are watching. We have left uh, a link for all of you who are looking at how they can uh, contribute directly with, uh, in this case, uh, with uh, Fuji schools, uh, a higher scholarship program um, mm -hmm. in, in conjunction with with incitement. Um, the link is right in the description below, so don't forget to click on that. Um, yes. Deborah, like I promised, uh, this is a short, sweet, Chris, and just nice. Um, I, I I hope everyone understands the intricacies that uh, this whole refugee crisis is more than what we can see from the media. Uh, for those who don't know, keep talking about it. Um, get in touch with the right people. Um, have that dialogue, as you mentioned and get involved as, as wherever you can uh, where, wherever you can do um so um so deborah thank you for having us on the show the, short, the shortest um, interview ever <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome you're welcome we'll keep it that way and uh we'll be in touch thank you again for having us thanks guys mm.